Hey there, Margie Bryce here bringing you the Krabby Pastor podcast. And I don't think you're going to be too surprised to know that it's too easy today to become the Krabby Pastor. Our time together will give you food for thought to help you be the ministry leader fully surrendered to God's purposes and living into whatever it takes to get you there and keep you there. So we're talking about sustainability in ministry. And we are back for another episode of the Krabby Pastor podcast. And you know, um, I'm advocating here for self-care, healthy self-care, so that you can go the distance with God and live into everything that God has for you and not miss a moment of the adventure, not having to experience burnout. And although, you know, God always does uh, take the uh, challenging parts of our lives and make something good happen. But I'm here again Mm -hmm. with Dr. Chris Adams here, Reverend Dr. Chris Adams to be specific. And and we're going to talk some more about some about the resistance piece to self-care. And I always liken this part to where the Apostle Paul says, and this is the bad Reverend Dr. Bryce paraphrase here of that, but you know, I don't know why I do that. (laughs) I don't want to be doing that. And I know the things that I should be doing, but I'm not doing that. And what is up with all of that? So that's, that's kind of the topic of (laughs) of this episode, Chris. So what is your experience with some of that to get us started? Yeah, such a great question. And, you know, one of the benefits of researching clergy well-being and and spending as much time as I do with pastors and, and doing things like this podcast. And thank you, Margie, again, for the opportunity is to remind myself of some things that I need to remember because I, I've bumped up against the resistance in myself. And mm-hmm. I hear that from pastors all the time, too. And I think maybe there are layers to that, one of which is maybe just the um, the way that as human beings, and maybe this is our fallenness, our fallen nature, we we sort of chafe against discipline in general. And so living into a rhythm of spiritual disciplines can be challenging for, for any of us, just as a believer, as a disciple. And in, in a lot of ways, what we're talking about is pastors living a disciplined life um, that maybe is what we're called to first and foremost. With clergy in particular, what we find from a research perspective, is that having a really one-dimensional view of what it means to be a person or a one-dimensional theological anthropology, the the academic word for that, can lead us to compartmentalize spirituality. So let me unpack what I mean by that. If we see spirituality as its own sort of component to life over here in this compartment, we can tend to then say something like, you know, okay, well, it doesn't matter how I'm doing physically, how my body's doing, how I'm doing relationally, emotionally, vocationally, financially, because I'm spiritually great, whatever that means. And as if spiritual formation doesn't include the whole person. And I would contend that the the biblical picture, Old and New Testament, actually is holistic. Mm -hmm. For example, we hear Paul say, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our spiritual act of worship. And mm-hmm. Jesus was bodily crucified and bodily resurrected. And there are implications to that theologically that we need to think about for for all of life. And so if we compartmentalize spirituality, then we will kind of minimize or dismiss a lot of these aspects of self-care that that we find tend to be issues for clergy. So physical well-being emotional well-being as a group of people tend to not be so good. And there are lots of reasons for that that are inherent in the job. But some of those have to do with our own lack of paying attention to the whole self um, Mm -hmm. as as an act of worship and as something that that God wants to transform in all of our lives in every area. But do you think that pastors like all people, because this is what uh, some of what my doctoral research found 
unsurprisingly that, you know, when it comes to wanting to be an authentic representation of Jesus, when it comes to wanting to be known as my identity is as a servant of Christ, yes, you still have to go through this participation phase where the rubber really meets the road mm -hmm. to get to the the authentic representation. You have to be a little mm -hmm. tried and tested, but and pastors resist that just like everybody else. You mm -hmm. know, I don't want to do the hard homework. I just want to you right. know, sit here with my book and my Bible and my theology books. And, you know, right. I'll, I'll spend this time in prayer. And basically we like everybody else on the planet, we like to hang where we are the most comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well said. And you know, some of that too may be, um, I, I love the line from one of Eugene Peterson's books, and I'm forgetting which book it is, but he, he talks about, you know, having all this seminary education and all these years of study as a pastor. And I believe the phrase he used was, I traffic in unlived truth. <laughs> in other words, oh. he, he knows a lot more in his head than he actually can fully implement in his life in any given moment. And so there's this knowledge action gap that I think all of us in ministry leadership have to some extent. And what we do with that gap makes all the difference. So what we can do is have unrealistically high expectations for ourselves because we want to sort of justify to ourselves or our congregation or to God this calling that is on our lives. It is mysterious after all. I mean, it's, you know, most pastors would say, I, I don't know how I ended up getting called to this. There's mystery in that. I, I'm living into that mystery, but we can sort of try to justify our paycheck or justify the calling by trying to live up to some ideal uh, that we have for ourselves that may not actually be something that's God breathed or God informed or bibli biblical. It's more pressure we're putting on ourselves. And certainly there's no shortage of expectations from other people on how we should should be doing our, our lives and our jobs, but the expectations pastors have on themselves are often the, the most difficult to get in with. And they can really fuel that living out of an, an unhealthy place um, that would resist conversations about pace, about Sabbath, about sustainability, about a theology of a uh, healthy theology of, of suffering, a healthy theology of risk, if you will, uh, in ministry. And it really, in my mind, comes back to a stewardship kind of conversation. How are you stewarding uh, resources, including yourself? That greatest thing God's given you for ministry is is who you are. And we want to last, be as effective in ministry for as long as possible. It's easy just to lose perspective on that. It right. Really it's, easy. it's easy to hang around with a lot of our commentaries and theology books and, yes. you know, but like you just pointed out though, that we live with, you know, you take in all this information and it doesn't get lived out because we take in a lot of information. Yes. And so that kind of just says to me, we even have to be disciplined there. Yes. And, and have our own uh, <laughs> goals for our own formation and, and well being that we're accountable somewhere in, I was also thinking, Margie, that the some of the research I've been a part of where pastors and how they responded to our surveys and, and their medical information and so forth, basically they were saying to us, I, I'm physically unhealthy. I have what's called metabolic syndrome, which is common among clergy. It's high blood pressure, high blood sugar, low good cholesterol, high blood pressure, those kinds of things. And I'm clinically depressed the way we would diagnose clinical depression which is probably at least as high among clergy as the general population, if not higher. And yet my spiritual vitality is high and none of that really impacts my ministry at all. It was basically what they were saying to us, which is a major disconnect, right? I mean, how, how is that even possible that that's not impacting your leadership or the, the effectiveness or quality of your ministry? But what pastors wrestle with so often is it, it feels selfish or self-indulgent to uh, to engage in self-care in some way. When I want to suggest to you, I mean, not only do we see that 
uh, to your listeners, not only do we see that modeled in the life of Jesus, but we, we also know from work on uh, research on work that there's a point of diminishing returns with work. So we get to a certain point after 40, 50, 60 hour week where we can push through and keep going, but our effectiveness, our creativity, our productivity uh, actually diminishes exponentially after a certain point. And if we instead took a break and went and rested, played, did things that were restorative, renewing, recreational mm-hmm. and that's holy spirit anytime you're talking about creation even you if bet. it's recreation that that's is right. there's a holy spirit connection there exactly right and and god designed us for those periods of rest and renewal um even in the genesis narrative there there is work going on before the fall in the genesis narrative if you read carefully and yet god mm-hmm. still is calling us to rhythms of of work and rest action and contemplation and in, in Christian spirituality. And if we do that, we actually come back to that same work with much more creativity, much more productivity, much more effectiveness. So taking care of ourselves is actually doing something for everybody else in our lives, um, our spouse, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our congregation. It, it is an, a spiritual discipline. It's an act of worship. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I'm I'm thinking about even like sermon construction and my background, because I was second career to ministry, I was heavily writing based. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a lot of marketing communications work, mm-hmm. would write feature stories and and this kind of thing. And even good writing coaches will tell you if you get to the place where, you know, it's not flowing anymore, go take a walk. Yeah, that's right. Set it aside for the next day. And that yes. always you know, and that was a podcast is how to avoid the Saturday night sermon shuffle. That's right. <laughs> Too many do. It's kind of like, yeah. don't do that because what you produce isn't going to be yes. really good quality. That's right. And and the importance of play to, to do something that you'd enjoy doing just for the sheer enjoyment of the activity, like literally like a child at play where you can lose yourself in the activity because mm-hmm. it's fun. And it takes your full attention to do it, meaning you, you can't also be mentally working, writing a sermon, creating that board meeting agenda in your head, crafting an email in your head, which we can tend to do while we're supposedly practicing Sabbath. We're actually mentally working. But mm-hmm. if you do something that takes your full attention, then you can't also be mentally working. And you also take a mental break as well as a physical break for ministry work. And to do that on a regular basis, at, at least 20 minutes to a half hour a week, whatever that thing is that for me, one of the, one of those things is playing tennis or pickleball is it takes my full attention to do it. I'm getting exercise. I'm doing it with someone else. And I just feel like a different person afterward. And it, it mm-hmm. helps me detach. There's a holy detachment that is so important that actually enables us to be much more effective when we are when those hours we are working. Right. I, I used to make fun of people who had craft rooms. I really did. I didn't get it yeah. until my last pastoral thing. And I had developed this interest in glass. And mm-hmm. so there was a store called all that glass. So I toddled in there just to see what that was about. And there was actually a stained glass class. And I'm thinking I've never done anything like this. Sure. I should do this. Well, you know, eight years later, and I have the beast of a workshop space with glass saws and. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> it's a, you know, it's like a it's a whole thing, and yeah, I sell it, you know, here and there. And, but well, sure. you know, think about what what I you know when I'm cutting glass, when I am you know because my yes. youngest son came in one day and said you know, your handle on glass there. I'm like, <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, I know what I'm doing with it yeah. too. But I That's found, I found that the restful part was that I could only think about what I was doing. Yes. I could not think about yeah. anything else. And that is a type of rest yeah. for your brain. You bet. And it's creative. It's using your hands. You can see what you finished when you're done. And there are all kinds of inherently sort of therapeutic things about that and Mm -hmm. um 
that kind of thing, whatever that is for your listeners, they need to identify that or remember that and just practice that on a regular basis. It's just incredibly important. So you're saying the resistance piece comes into the fact that we really don't want to be disciplined people. (laughs) I think that's part of it. I mean, maybe that just preaching to myself, but yeah, there's something in us that kind of resists that even the word discipline uh, has a lot of negative connotations. So some people like to talk about spiritual practices. Maybe that has a little more positive connotation or something, but what, what are the things it, that we can do in, in the research? The, the encouraging part of the research is you don't have to all of a sudden become, you know, John Wesley and get up at three in the morning and pray for three hours and, you know, do massive radical practices like that starting small but being frequent and consistent really does make a difference so for example just five minutes of silence a day in the middle of the day if you're not practicing any kind of silence done every day day in day out week in week out month in month out actually makes a significant difference over time there's a positive accumulation the same way we talked about in, in our previous episode about burnout accumulating Mm -hmm. positive things can also accumulate and so it's the frequent consistent small practices done throughout the day that over time really do make a big difference they add up Mm -hmm, for sure and i like to quote author james clear who talks a lot about building and sustaining habits Mm. and he said just a little bit with a one percent increase over time yields big results but if you actually end up doing nothing, you you start losing ground. That's exactly right. So and, doing doing nothing is making a choice. That that has well, it's a choice to go backwards. Really, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as scary as that is, I mean, I wish I could tell my forty year old self, you you need to be doing like some yoga, Pilates, and other yeah. kinds of things besides getting on your bike and riding like a fiend. You know. There's, yes. To try to sow good stuff into your into yourself, what would you say is the biggest resistance to self care? Yeah, I think it's uh, maybe what I might call a false guilt that can, you know, again, not having thought all the way through a really robust theology of suffering and sacrifice, where I, I on some level, am. am living out some sort of self-imposed martyrdom kind of complex either because of of uh, underdeveloped theology or also psychological reasons i i was listening to a lecture not too long ago by a church historian on the first century church and martyrdom and he made this really interesting point it was interesting to me i think relevant to this conversation that in the first century you sort of became Christian famous in the ancient world if you were martyred, and because a lot of people were martyred, right? The persecution of the Christian faith by the Roman Empire and so forth. And even as we do this podcast, there are places in the world where um, people's lives are demanded of them because of their faith in Christ. And so that that is a real thing. <clears throat> However, um, the church had this problem where people were sort of seeking after martyrdom in ways that were more pseudo-martyrdom than the authentic thing. So they had to put criteria in place for what was a true martyr and what was not. And the first criteria was that the person was not seeking to become a martyr. So uh, why would people seek to do that? I think because it was notoriety, it was fame, or it was seen as the ultimate expression of my faith in Christ or something. When what I I think we see in scripture is that uh, as we talked about in our last episode jesus already died for the church and so if we really believe what god accomplished in the cross and resurrection of christ was sufficient we don't need to add ourselves to that uh, martyrdom list and we want to be as effective as long as possible so that for the sake of the gospel and the sake of the church and, and god's kingdom in the world and if it comes to it and our life is demanded of us then then that may happen. And yet I don't see disciples seeking that. 
they're trying to stay alive as long as possible and be strategic even in that and yet also not not deny the gospel or not minimize their faith if if it comes to that that moment of of uh, decisiveness where their life is demanded of them but we don't see them going around seeking that either well in some cases ministry leaders sacrifice their personhood yes and just so into the spiritual you know i'm yes praying i'm reading my bible i'm doing all i'm sowing to my soul heavily but i'm ignoring that i have a physical body that needs attention and an emotional state that needs attention why do we do that well i love what uh, Pete Scazzaro says, if you're familiar with emotionally healthy spirituality, emotionally healthy discipleship, that we can find ourselves doing more for God than our being with God can sustain. And so we, we're we busy doing the work of God and forget about our relationship with the Lord of the work um, in, in a holistic sense. And so uh, the truth is, if we don't pay attention holistically at some point we we aren't effective to anybody because our physical health is so impaired our emotional health our relational um, health is so impaired because it's been neglected that we're actually not effective anymore for the kingdom Um, one of the things my my grandfather who who had a heart attack young and then later died young of a heart attack but he said to my dad laying in the hospital was you know i don't feel like i'm any good to the kingdom laying flat on my back like this and i really he was thinking about what could I have done differently to pace myself, to care for myself, to avoid this um, so that he could have continued longer um, in pastoral ministry. I like what you said earlier about it being a stewardship issue and Mm -hmm. it's a stewardship of yourself, but you have to then recognize that there is a spiritual piece. There is, and there is a bodily piece. Yes. Spelt P I E C E in case somebody's thinking the other way, but to be attended to and to be a steward of. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And that, that spiritual formation includes all of that. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Including our bodies. For sure. For sure. For sure. Well, any parting thoughts that you'd like to add in? I, I think maybe as a word of encouragement, the, the thing I might say to your listeners is uh, to also be be gentle with yourself, um, even as you listen to a podcast like this and mm-hmm. might feel the Holy Spirit nudging you and convicting you. And, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit is always a gentle, redemptive conviction. It's not a let me beat myself up even more for not doing this the way I was supposed to. That's certainly not what I think you or I would want for people right. listening to this, but it's let me confess what I need to confess. I'll allow God to to shape and form and mold, but it's it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And, mm-hmm. and so we don't need to be stuck in a place of, of shame or self-abuse, which can often be a, a pattern for leaders because we, we're just so hard on ourselves. And to practice self-compassion and self-acceptance, I think, are really important pieces of, of what I would consider is, is a biblical version of self-esteem. It's not being self-centered or selfish. Mm-hmm. It's it's being... And that's P-E-A-C-E this time, That's right. right. <laughs> that's right. Being in a place of, of, uh, of knowing ourselves well and really receiving God's grace and love at, at a deep level. Which sets us free. Absolutely. And my call to offer, you know, a better and deeper look at self-care has more to do with not wanting to lump another thing or more things onto people. But maybe to say to them, maybe some of your time could be donated to this. That's right. What, what could you, you know, give to helping to nurture your body, sustain? Yeah. I mean, our body, we're finite. Yes. We are finite. There are limits to right. 
what we can do. And yeah, there's some seasons where you're a little more pedal to the metal than others. I mean, certainly maybe during Christmas and Easter and all the more reasons that sure. you know you need to make sure that you are taking care of yourself in some fashion. Yes. In well, a small piece, way. The other piece I might add to that is um, I, I find myself in some ways wrestling with the language of self-care because that can unintentionally imply that all that needs to happen is pastors need to take better care of themselves. And in most cases, most of us do in some area, but I've seen that sort of weaponized against pastors in a Mm. way where really it's the, it's the congregational system or even the denominational system that needs some attention and intervention. It's the environment that's being created uh, for a pastor to live and serve in that also needs to pay attention to certain things, what what kind of environment's being created for a person to to flourish or not within that as a leader, and it really is both. It's it's the system as well as our own pace and care of ourselves, and <laughs> so we're we're just starting to research more. What does that look like when that's healthy? What are the factors and conditions and you kind know, of best practices for congregations to to make the life of the leader as sustainable as possible mm-hmm. and joy filled as possible. And I have some inklings then that if you start talking with millennials and younger, they have a much more intentional work yes. life balance. I think that's true. Uh-huh. That they are bringing with them into the church environment and, yeah. and speaking up. And I mean, I was second career, to ministry. So I would go into a situation, you know, if I was the associate and I did this in once in one instance where I said, so to the senior pastor, okay, what day is your Sabbath day? Yeah. And he just like laughed. Yeah. And I thought, what? <laughs> Are yeah. we not living this? Are we not, well, you know, and so you're you watch that and you see pastors not taking vacations and somehow feeling right. like they get a spiritual badge of courage or something. And That's I thought, right. boy, I can't, I can't offer my best to God that yeah. way. I have to go at, like you said, pace. And I talk in workshops about pace and load, but I also start a workshop with one thing. What is one thing that you're going to ask to be attentive to that God is going to show you, why don't you mm-hmm. just work on this a little bit? Mm-hmm. Yep. So if That's you're going to, you know, look at exercise, nobody's saying you have to do a marathon. I mean, I do right. have friends that do that. I think that's crazy, but good for them. Right. No, if you're doing not much, then maybe getting out for a 20 minute walk, not even at a brisk pace, but just getting out and moving is something. So what is one thing that, that God is asking you to pay attention to? And start there, start small, do it consistently, frequently, and and go from there. Uh, to put a fine point on it, I um, was speaking at a denominational gathering of a, a sister denomination to the Church of Nazarene. And one of the key leaders stood up and said, it was several thousand of their pastors, <clears throat> stood up and said to, to neglect the kind of things we're talking about, Margie, is a form of clergy misconduct. Hmm. It was a really strong statement wow. coming from a leader. And yet, you know, when you look at the story after story of pastors engaging in some form of misconduct or having to leave ministry career prematurely, and you do sort of the after the fact autopsy, if you will, on the what led to that, in every single case, it's it's neglecting the kinds of things we're talking about. Sure, sure. And my cousin is a Greek Orthodox priest. I have a very unusual Mm. spiritual heritage. And he was just saying, I said something about dessert. And he said, you know, I was looking at my overall health and I thought, what is one thing, one thing I can do? And he said, I decided I was giving up sweets. I kind of thought that was a little over the top, but hey, um, he, (laughs) he, that's what... I can do this. So what is, yes. that is the, the challenge. Right. What's, 
one thing you could start to weave yeah. and knit in. And then maybe in another six months or whatever, what is something else you right. know, that you can and start to right. just knit that into your way of being? Yes. So again, that's that you can it. go the distance with whatever God has for you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm, I think I'm going to leave that there. And thanks again so much, Chris, for coming by, for sharing some really great wisdom with us. I really appreciate that. Honored to do it. My pleasure. Thanks, Margie. Blessings. Okay. The Krabby Pastor Podcast is brought to you by Bryce Coaching, and I connect with ministry leaders and help them when they are stuck, help them when they need to know what their next steps are, and just a journey with them, which is a type of self-care, actually. But this podcast is also brought to you by Bryce Glass Art. You can find that on Facebook. So when I am doing this podcast, it is paid for and sponsored by the glass articles that I make and sell and the coaching that I do. And it is my privilege to call you to radical self-care so that you can go the distance with God. Hey, thanks for listening. It is my deep desire and passion to champion issues of sustainability in ministry and for your life. So I'm here to help. I stepped back from pastoral ministry and I feel called to help ministry leaders uh, create and cultivate sustainability in their lives so that they can go the distance with God and whatever plans that God has for you. I would love to help. I would consider it an honor. And in all things, make sure you connect to these sustainability practices, you know, so that you don't become the crabby pastor.